Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Moser, Professor of History and Co-Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program at Ashland University. Welcome to our second season of Documents in Detail, TeachingAmericanHistory.org's webinar series. In each episode, we do a deep dive into a single document, discussing the historical, literary, and rhetorical aspects of said document, while also analyzing its impact on American history, people, and thought. TeachingAmericanHistory.org is a project of the Ashbrook Center, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based at Ashland University. We provide a variety of programs and resources for teachers of American history, government, and civics, all based on primary documents. In the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. To help us begin to think about the topics of this year's webinars, we are drawing speeches, letters, and writings from the Ashbrook Center's extensive document database available at TAH.org. And you, too, can participate in the discussion by typing your questions into the chat window at the bottom of your screen at any time. The subject of today's program is Theodore Roosevelt's New Nationalism speech. And to help discuss it are Dr. Jennifer Keane, Professor of History at Chapman University, and Dr. J. David Alvis, Associate Professor of Political Science at Wofford College. Jennifer, David, welcome. So the new nationalism speech. Uh, let's just start off with a by asking why is this speech so important? <laughs> uh, I'll jump in to that to that question. Um, well, I think that uh, it's a really important speech in in, in several ways. Um, one is that it is a speech that, in a very interesting way, reframes the memory of John Brown as something that can afford reconciliation between the South and the North. So at this particular historical moment, that's a, a very important political development that's happening in the country. Um, and, the, and the second really important thing is that you can really derive almost the entire agenda of progressivism in this speech. And it's a, a way to put progressivism in an American tradition of maintaining national unity and progress. And so in that sense, it's really, let's put past political disputes behind us, let's address present political disputes to move into a future of unity and progress. Okay, yeah, I agree. David, can you add to that? Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, with Jennifer that the, 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 really, the, the important thing here too is, is that it's given at the John Brown Memorial Park. And it's an attempt to remind the Republican Party of its uh, radical, of its roots, right, uh, in, uh, in Lincoln, in um, the, um, uh, the Emancipation uh, Proclamation, and then also to tie that to uh, the period, that period's most radical abolitionist, uh, John Brown. So in some ways it's designed to to uh, tell, remind Republicans that you come from radical origins, radical reformist origins, and um, and therefore you need to embrace that because that's an important part of your party, uh, especially at a time when Republicans were known as stand patters, uh, who generally uh, tried to, to avoid any reform initiative uh, during the during this progressive era. The other thing too is, is that in 1910 uh, the Republicans do very badly. Uh, in the midterm elections under Taft. And um, the, in fact, you have the emergence of the Progressive Republican League, uh, a sort of alternative third party uh, that develops under the leadership of uh, the former uh, Wisconsin governor, now Senator Robert La Follette. So the, so the Republicans are beginning to split. And at this point in 1910, on the one hand, uh, Theodore Roosevelt has not joined this new rep progressive group, but on the other hand, he's resisted um, endorsing Taft uh, for re-election. So this speech is in some ways an important attempt to situate himself in the emerging problems, uh, in the emerging uh, political development of the Republican Party 
And in some ways, he's trying to, I think, frame a new direction for that, uh, for the Republican Party under his own leadership rather than that of Taft. Okay, it's a lot to unpack here, but but I but I want to point out what I what I see as a as a bit of a a contrast between the two ways that uh, the ways that the two of you treat the use of John Brown. Jennifer suggests it is a means of promoting reconciliation, but David, you say it's a uh, uh, it, it's it's a way of signaling radicalism. Yeah. Uh, which is it, or can it be both? Well, I think. I mean, I think partly. I think partly. It's. It's. I. I think it is designed to uh, that in some ways. See, Ro Roosevelt has been saying for a while. Look, don't you remember? You know, you're the party of of Lincoln. He said this often as president, right? That the Republican Party is the party of Lincoln, and that meant uh, embracing reform, just as Lincoln reformed the American. Uh, political system by abolishing slavery. So we Republicans today ought to be embracing the cause of uh, of, of progressive reform. And but Lincoln's not John Brown. Yeah. So the thing is, what's interesting is, I think for for Roosevelt is is that the pro that 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 just receives a sort of de um, uh, a non plus response from the Republicans. They're just deaf to that to that appeal. And so I think he thinks that the only way to uh, really call attention to how mediocre their uh, reform efforts have been is to sort of um, raise the stakes by saying uh, it's not just um, Abraham Lincoln, it's also to the, the radical abolition movement. That's what's the essence of the Republican Party. And while I mean, I think that that's not true, that, that in fact, Lincoln actually gave a speech quite critical of John Brown. Uh, Roosevelt ignores that for the sake of trying to radicalize the meaning of the party in order to overcome what he what he would consider sort of the the increasing fossilization of the Republican Party at the time. So I, I, yeah, I, I, I go ahead. Okay, I would see it a little. I do see it a little differently. Um, I think it was quite interesting that. Um, John Brown is never called any of these things, so he's not called an abolitionist. He's not called a terrorist, which when you're talking about Kansas is, um, is often, <laughs> he's not called a murderer. Um, he's not called any of these things. Um, I think I was trying to find it, and it took me maybe till about page six for slavery even to be mentioned. Um, John Brown in this speech is a man of principle. He's a man who fought for principle just like you did in the Grand Armory of the Republic, which is his audience, and this is a, a, a traditionally partisan crowd for Roosevelt. I mean, this is the group that has really helped the Republicans out politically. He could have easily waved the bloody shirt and reignited sectional tension, but instead he embraces the language of 1910, which is a language of there were principled men on both sides. We both fought for what we believed in, and, and now these are past quarrels, and it, and now we need to unify to the present quarrel, which is between capital and labor, um, between the moneyed interests and and the working interests. It's not any more of this sort of sectional divide that that has has sort of you know dominated political discourse for so long. So it's a it's such an interesting speech. I mean, Lincoln, you can kind of understand maybe rehabilitating this way. Uh, John Brown is a is an interesting character to to paint in, in this way. And I think that he's he's really suggesting that it's the national, and this is where we get to the new nationalism. It's uh, the national that we have to focus on now, not the sectional anymore. Now our problems are national in scope. It will require a national solution from a federal government that has everybody's interests, the general welfare, not just the welfare of the North, not just the welfare of former Union soldiers, and so this is a new unifying cry for, for us. And if you contextualize it, um, you know, in terms of different things that are going on in American society, cultural things, I mean, you know, we've been having plenty of discussion about Confederate monuments lately. And, you know, this is the moment when many of those are being erected. So there's, this is the, this is the discourse. Um, and Roosevelt is embracing that. And of course, you know, Wilson will certainly continue it. So I think in that sense, it really is a, a repurposing of this, of this history. <laughs> so, 
sorry. <laughs> I felt like that was a commentary on what I was saying. <laughs> I think, was, let's, let's, I think he was saying, yes, you're right. <laughs> he was upstairs sleeping and he finally made his entrance. <laughs> let's talk Let's talk about um, how Roosevelt uses Lincoln. He, he, he clearly wants to, wants to claim the mantle of, uh, of, of Lincoln, uh, Lincoln for himself. Um, how, how true is he to the Lincolnian memory? That's a great question. I mean, in, in you know, he really he he often invokes right Lincoln in the new nationalism speech, and also too. I mean, he has a number of speeches which are uh, directly on uh, the statesmanship of of Abraham Lincoln, and even during his presidency, Lincoln was a, a fairly constant refrain uh, or model that um, Theodore Roosevelt referred to. Uh, as a uh, as a justification for reform, and you can see kind of what his argument here is in his quote uh, from uh, he's quoting two different speeches uh, uh, by Lincoln, and um, uh, uh, one from Cincinnati, one from uh, uh, the address to uh, uh, in Minneapolis, and the um, you can see right the the argument that he makes is if you if you look at that second page of the uh, the new nationalism speech, uh, that second that second block quote that he takes from Lincoln, where he says, labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is only the fruit of labor and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. Labor is the superior of capital and deserves much higher consideration. Uh, you can see why that quote would be really important for uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and that is, uh, in the contending battle, right, between the owners of capital, which during the progressive era, uh, they own a, actually a great deal of wealth and tend to have uh, some s significant concentrations of economic power uh, over various industries during this time. I mean, they're known as the robber barons. Um, you've got them on the one side and you've got ordinary Americans on the other who generally uh, associate themselves with being laborers. And this confrontation between capital and labor, you know, on the one hand, uh, most Republicans disparaged having that kind of argument because their argument was that's class warfare, that's bad for America, uh, that will hurt the nation, we shouldn't have any uh, legislation or reform that's based on class legislation. And here, what Roosevelt is saying is, look, we're the, part, we're the Republican Party, we're the party of Lincoln, and Lincoln in his own day thought that there was a tension between capital and labor. And, you know, the, the common argument response to that was, well, you're a communist, right? You're a, you're a Marxist. And the, the, argument, the, argument, the argument here of Lincoln is, I mean, I'm sorry, of, of Roosevelt here, is that in fact that there's nothing radical, there's nothing uh, communist about this argument. It goes back to Lincoln himself. Um, so in some ways, he wants to use this, uh, use Lincoln, right, as a sort of basis for the for his own uh, arguments about how to reform the economic structure of the country, and in some ways to claim that his arguments really aren't that radical. They go all the way back to the very origins of the, uh, of the Republican Party. Yeah, and I would just add to that that I think that he's using Lincoln rhetorically to argue that Lincoln saved the Union and he saved it for free men. And he saved it from property money and interests that at the time of the Civil War were represented by the slave aristocracy, the slave holding aristocracy, I should say. And this idea that the, the Kansas comes into play here because if the West cannot be made free uh, for free men, then the future of the Republic is in danger. And in that same kind of way, the tension between labor and capital in the progressive era is endangering the future of free men. And so it, you, you can make this parallel, or Roosevelt can make this parallel between the way that Lincoln saved the country and saved opportunity in the country with the 
present struggle that Roosevelt is confronting with um, the concentration of, mon of capital in, in monopolies that runs the same risk of destroying the country. And in that sense, these quotes then are, um, even though Lincoln is obviously writing them in, in a completely different context, they're, they're showing that these, they're, these uh, two crises that the nation has faced in this respect deserve a similar, um, a similar response. And it has been the Republicans who have risen to this occasion both times. So I think there's also that kind of tradition that he's trying to establish. We've already mentioned the, the did you want to, sorry, Dave, did you want to add something to that? Well, just, uh, I mean, it's Go worth ahead. noting just real quickly too, in some ways uh, that, you know, like, like most, you know, isolated quotations from previous uh, uh, political figures, right? There's uh, something slightly misleading here in the in the quote from Lincoln. I just want to I just want to point it out, but I don't want to make it much of it until we come to the later parts of the uh, speech. But I do want to point out what um, what Lincoln was addressing when he when he wrote these comments about le the relationship of labor and capital, and that is uh, there the contention of the South when it came to defending slavery had been that. You know, when it comes to fr either free labor or slave labor, it doesn't really matter. The, the distinction is not really that great because labor always has to be bought with capital. So what's really the difference between slave labor and free labor if all of it is really bought by capital? Because at the end of the day, according to the South, capital comes prior uh, to labor. And that's what Lincoln is responding to. Lincoln is saying, no, uh, labor is prior to capital. It's, it's only through labor and through work that you get capital. Um, that Lincoln here, though, is trying to set up an argument between capital and labor would be reading Lincoln out of context. Rather, what he's addressing is that, that, that particular claim of the South by which they were defending slavery is not really being that different from free labor. It, uh, we've already mentioned um, the significance of the audience here. This is the Grand Army of the Republic. Jennifer mentioned that this was a uh, this was a, 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 a reliable base of support for uh, for the Republican Party. Um, and several times he speaks directly to uh, to them as soldiers, and almost seems to suggest that. There was a uh, that the army is a model for the, how the rest of society should function. Could either of either or both of you uh, say a little about that? Well, I think well, like all good, um, what do I say? Presidents, he he cherry picks the examples he wants to give. So he he gives examples. I mean, it's important for him to present the military as a place where men can rise according to their ability and also um, a way to argue that success in combat comes from everybody doing their part. So you need to have good leaders, you need to have good soldiers, you need to have good cause, and all of these things work in concert towards victory and to kind of make an analogy to the way that citizens should relate to the government and the way that society should also be offering opportunity for men of merit to be able to rise up and um, and take positions of, of leadership. And I think that, um, you know, I, I was I was actually, I'm actually always wondering this about, about this speech, which is that, you know, how much of this is really the way he's thinking or how much of it is that, um, you know, when progressives talk, it can get boring fast because it's just <laughs> one you know, problem and law after the other. And I mean, this really, um, it makes it concrete to people. So when you're talking in these sort of philosophical uh, ways about um, abstract economic conflict and how to come out of it and the role of the government, you know, how do you really take this down and make it manageable for people to understand or relate to their personal experience? And I, I, I saw a little rhetorical technique in here in terms of the way that he's really 
um, why he's bringing this up and to this particular group of veterans who have been in the military. Because if you n know much about how the Civil War Army operated, this is not how it worked. So I mean, it's um, in that sense, it's kind of funny actually to uh, to read it. I didn't see McClellan in there, for example. I mean, there was no, uh, you know, <laughs> so no, no, none of that. But well, that's, I also think you find in in Roosevelt, you also find a lot of um, sort of um, military rhetoric. Right, sort of mil and uh, particularly an emphasis on military uh, virtue, and this this has a lot to do. It's it's not just a rhetorical device, right? It's also too, has a lot to do with his critique of American society and what the real problems of the American political order are during the Progressive Era. Um, I mean, essentially, his basic point is Americans, right? Particularly commercial life because of the advance of commercial life. Uh, Americans are wimps, you know, they're, they're wimpy people. Um, and, the, uh, and, and this is particularly the, his critique of commercial life. Commercial life makes um, uh, human beings soft and, 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 and therefore does not prepare them for the heroic uh, virtues that really make life worth living. And the heroic virtues point away from our own individual self-interest towards the good of society. And it's that, that, it's that internalization of a commercial society, that only thinking about myself and my sort of banal desires, um, that really um, is the many, that explains many of the problems going on uh, during this era. Um, the problem with corporate greed, uh, the problem with political corruption, the problem with political bosses, right? Um, all of them can be partly explained by the lack of character uh, among, among human beings, this unwillingness to sacrifice uh, for uh, gr more noble ends, and this lack of willingness to care for the common good of society over one's own self uh, self-interest. And if you look at the last kind of five lines of the whole speech, you know, he really brings, at the, at the conclusion, he brings the speech to the point, to the issue not of institutional reforms or economic corrections, but to matters of character. And in the last, I say, about five lines, he says, uh, it starts kind of in the middle, he says, we must have the right kind of character, a character that makes a man, first of all, a good man in the home, a good father and a good husband that makes a man a good neighbor. You must have that. And then in addition, you must have the kind of law and the kind of administration of the law which will give to those qualities in the private citizen the best possible chance for development. The prime problem of our nation is to get the right, uh, is to get the right type of good citizenship. And to get it, we must have progress and our public men must be genuinely progressive. So one of the deepest problems with the nation is the lack of character, right? And so, you know, he gives uh, uh, speeches and writes actually books on the strenuous life, and he writes these sort of histories that are about, you know, manliness, right? Like the winning of the West. For him, right, cultivating that is one of the primary, I think, primary reforms he sees as necessary to the progressive era. And it's also very much, we, we mentioned the military aspect to it, it's very much behind his argument why we need to play a, a greater international role as a country. And that is we should, we should take our military responsibilities in the world seriously, because that's, that's how you cultivate the right kind of citizenship and the right qualities of virtue. So everything from the Great White Fleet to Panama, Right, is very much a part of that cultivation of, of military virtue. I see. I actually see uh, military references a lot in uh, in in progressive writing. And and one one thing that I, I find striking, particularly in this speech, when he talks about promotion. Right, everybody everybody appreciates when when talented people get get promoted in the army. But who does the promotion? It comes from the top. 
So he's one of the what, what he seems to admire about the army is it's is it's top down and everyone plays a role in this disciplined order. Uh, in fact, I I, I recently reread uh, uh, FDR's first inaugural address, and so many of the same themes. How he's how he's we're mobilizing the country as if it were for uh, for war, and he is the commander in chief of this 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 army that's going to get us through the uh, get us out of the uh, out of the crisis. I find this 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 comparison uh, really striking. Uh, let's go to uh, because David, you you mentioned uh, foreign affairs. We have a question here. Um, in his discussion of foreign affairs, Roosevelt said he would, quote, hang my head in shame if we would take advantage of a weaker power, unquote. Uh, how does that square with Teddy Roosevelt's own foreign policy regarding Panama when he was president? And, and did anyone call him on it, I guess, is a, another question. Well, yeah. second, can I say Go something? Ahead. Um, the second part of that quote is, um, if I can find it, because I'm there. Um, I should heart. I should be heartily ashamed to see us wrong a weaker power, and I should hang my head forever if we tamingly suffer wrong from a stronger power. So there is a sense here of both our responsibility to behave in a morally upright way in, internationally, but also to not allow ourselves to fall into a state of military disrepair where people could take advantage of us. And I think that this, um, you also can see in this speech this idea of being an international policeman. That, and, and this, I think, connects to uh, just what David was saying about Roosevelt's notion about what has to happen at home to reestablish order. And the progressives are all about order. And there's a sense that there's two disruptive forces in America right now. It's the rabble, who the mob, the, who, are, who are just agitating for revolution. But it's also the money monopolists who are selfish and self-absorbed and are taking and are, are also are reactionary. And they are also destructive forces. And the progressives are very much about, you know, let's try to get back to this middle class paradise that they imagine America once was and an order and people playing their part and being unified. This is this is the vision they have. And Roosevelt has that at home and he has it internationally. I mean, he does not perceive intervening in Panama as something wrong to do because it brings order to the region um, and it, it it helps the U.S. It helps them. He's you know, he's he's. He's justifying himself, obviously, in many respects. But it's it's this it's a language. If you look at the Roosevelt corollary, you know that we are going to correct wrongdoing, and it's 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 all in this idea that the moral clarity that um, America has in its leadership is going to allow it to do these things internationally. So I think that the second part of that quote has to be put in there. Otherwise, it's hard to see how he's actually um, positioning the U.S. Yeah, I, David? I think too. I mean, his his uh, defense of our uh, sort of colonial treatment of countries like the Philippines. I'm I'm not exactly sure how he uh, uh, defended uh, some of the actions in terms of Colombia and the removal of his of it, um, uh, sort of undermining his president. I mean, if if he just saw it as political expediency or or what, but the um, you know, certainly in the case of, of the Philippines and, uh, and and of Cuba, I mean, he he very much uh, he does uh, uh, address those those, uh, those situations and says and very and defends American imperialism, um, and in fact argues for more American imperialism, and he does so on a uh, he has a, a very clear reason for uh, for making that argument. He says, "Look, um, the Teutonic races uh, are the is the superior race. It is the most civilized. It is capable of the highest degree of virtue. It's capable uh, of the. It has the highest level of intelligence. And it is the obligation of the Teutonic races to bring to less civilized countries to elevate less civilized countries to a higher status of civilization." And so the, I think in, in many cases, and he probably would have defended Panama uh, probably along these lines, 
is uh, that you've got that you've got to bring to barbaric peoples right uh, a higher order of being, and that is the obligation of the uh, uh, of America because it, it embodies those those Teutonic virtues, those Teutonic qualities. Um, so in some ways, I think he he would really see what we have done, uh, what the that imperial policy as being perfectly complementary um, to um, what the um, of what the role of the United States ought to be as a progressive country. What are Roosevelt's sources of inspiration? Where do his ideas come from? Yeah. At least as expressed in this speech. If part, uh, partly it comes, I mean, one of his major uh, uh, influences is uh, a, uh, a writer, a public intellectual at the time uh, named Herbert Crowley. Um, the, uh, Crowley was the founder of the New Republic, a progressive journal, um, and wrote, uh, kind of a, a treatise that kind of, kind of became a, a, sort of the Bible of the progressive movement, uh, known as the Promise of American Life, and it's Crowley that coins this term, uh, the New Nationalism, and so, um, Roosevelt read that book after his return from, uh, the safari after, uh, after his uh, uh, after his presidency, and um, and, and uh, engaged in a lengthy correspondence with with Crowley, and that that was one of his uh, that that tended to be one of his uh, uh, major influences. Uh, his other major influences tended to be these um, uh, sociologists and uh, kind of uh, German historical intellectuals uh, for, uh, that he studied under. Uh, at Harvard. It was from them he developed a lot of his ideas uh, regarding uh, the theory of his theories of race, right, and the Teutonic races uh, that we mentioned uh, before, and also too, in some ways, his conceptions of what the what the role of the national government ought to be in bringing about a more fair and and progressive uh, national state. Jennifer, anything to add to that? Well, I think also he's influenced by his own experiences. I mean, I think when you read him, you can also uh, see some of the autobiogra autobiographical details of his life that are that are coming through. I mean, he himself, you know, uh, sort of learns the virtue of a strenuous life. He he um, he's educated by progressive reformers, not just by what he reads, but like by Jacob Rees when he's police commissioner of New York in terms of being exposed to parts of life that he didn't he didn't previously see. He's He's been a soldier. He's he's done these things, and so he's sort of speaking with conviction—not just intellectual conviction, but conviction of the way that he's lived. Um, you know, he's 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 been out in the West. He collects these Rough Riders. These are people come from all walks of life. This idea of this kind of the way that America can really come together as one. And so I think that there's also a way that he's he believe, he's living what he's saying, and so he he speaks with tremendous conviction. In speeches like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk a little about the the the, the, the context of, of the political scene at the time. Um, uh, one of you, I think, I think it was David, who was who said that that in August 1910, uh, T.R. was still being a little bit cagey about the future. He was not willing to uh, embrace um, Robert La Follette's movement. Nevertheless, he was also unwilling to uh, uh, to endorse. Uh, his his hand-picked successor as president, well, as president William Howard Taft. What was the nature of uh, what was the source of his dispute with Taft? <laughs> That's great. Uh, so uh, the 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 differences. It's interesting. The difference that you would think that the differences between uh, uh, T. R. and Taft came from the differences that we perceive, right? And that is Taft as the conservative constitutionalist, TR as the uh, dramatic progressive uh, reformer who's focused on, on you know, executive power and not really concerned about the um, uh, li li uh, limitations or letter of the Constitution. You, so we, we generally perceive that that was kind of where their uh, differences began, or uh, where their differences uh, emerged. Ironically, it turns out that the differences between Taft and TR um, emerged over uh, personal disagreements. 
and that was that um, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, we, associ we famously associate Theodore Roosevelt with trust busting. Uh, what, we, what is often not noted is, is that he um, actually made a lot of deals uh, with a number of these uh, corporate barons, including um, uh, Rockefeller and the uh, inter international, uh, uh, a company known as uh, International Harvester um, that was kind of part of the uh, Rockefeller Trust. And so anyway, he, he made a deal with them. Um, it was, you know, uh, international Harvester was kind of part of, uh, part of Standard Oil. And uh, Taft, when Taft came to office, Taft said, well, you know, it's my obligation to prosecute these trusts, and I'm going to prosecute all of them, including uh, the International Harvester. And, the, the, and, and so Taft wasn't going to make any exceptions, and Taft actually ended up prosecuting many more trusts than Theodore Roosevelt. Well, when, TR, when Taft went after International Harvester, um, the... Uh, Theodore Roosevelt re, re, uh, viewed that as a personal betrayal. And then also, too, Taft ended up, um, you know, getting rid of some of the um, uh, figures in the Theodore Roosevelt's administration. TR continued to take that personally. And so ultimately, uh, really, a, a lot of their differences arose initially over personal, what they, what, especially what TR viewed as personal slights. Um, based on uh, TR's uh, uh, actions during, uh, I mean, Taft's actions uh, as president. Hmm. Jennifer. Yeah, I think that that's right. And I think that just to throw also uh, the idea of uh, Roosevelt's conservation legacy into, into that mix, that you know, this was something you can see this in his speech, you know, how he's really bringing that up as a really important part of what he felt he had left. And the idea that that was being diluted as well. And this hope that that there would be a kind of middle ground between conservation and preservation and that and that this also was a legacy that was being diluted. Um, and then I would just add, again, there's just a tremendous amount of ego here. I mean, there is an irony that Roosevelt is trumpeting democracy and people's choice and people being involved, but then he's almost acting like, well, I've designated you as my successor and you must continue to <laughs> be yeah. my disciple. And then gets outraged when Taft says, well, actually, I'm president now and I might have some other ideas. And so there's this kind of ironic way in which he's his own, he's trying to build his own sort of political machine and political empire and gets really outraged when um, he's, he's no longer a relevant political figure in terms of what Taft wants to do. So I think that there's a little bit of that, that going on as well. Yeah, I, wonder if, if, I wonder if we don't see a tension between uh, Roosevelt's emphasis on, on, on real democracy and the voice of the people and, for example, his suggestion that the tariff be settled by a group of experts, an expert tariff commission, uh, an, a, 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 a special government bureau, again, of, of, of experts who are going to regulate the, uh, uh, who are going to regulate the, the corporations. Is, is, there, is there a tension there as well? Well, could I just say, this is, this is the tension in progressivism. I mean, progressives yeah. they're always... On, I mean, this is what they're always battling against. On the one hand, you have this progressive faith and expertise, the expert who will be somehow unbiased and be able to just deal with facts should be always consulted in these cases. But then you have the appeal to public opinion, that the only way we can mobilize enough pressure to make change happen is by appealing to public opinion. And so if you think of the muckrakers who are doing expose after expose and they want to get people really worked up about child labor and about, you know, women working and about all these workmen's compensation, all these things. But then the idea is the ultimate solution goes to an expert and and then you just accept what that expert commission tells you. I mean, this is this is always the dilemma and it's the it's the problem of wanting democracy, but being extremely paternalistic at the same time. And I think that this speech really embodies that. So it embodies a lot of Roosevelt, but it's also embodying sort of central contradictions in progressivism that to a certain extent we still grapple with, that we want the, the, we believe in science, we believe in data, we want the 
expert solution, but then we also claim that, well, we should go, you know, right to the people, direct democracy, direct primary, direct election of senators. I mean, the people should be voicing. But what if the people voice things that the experts disagree with? Then what, how do you resolve that? And so I think that these are these are definitely, but I don't think they're just Roosevelt's contradictions is my point. My point is that I think this is endemic to the progressive movement. Okay. David? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is the, the heart of the problem of progressivism is on the one hand, you need, you, you need experts to solve problems because our, our old sort of limited government solutions don't work anymore. Um, you, you need, you, you, you you know, you've got a robust, dynamic economy, right? You, you can't sit around hoping, right, that three separated branches of government will resolve these difficulties. You need people who have broad discretionary powers and a lot of expertise who can react as quickly as the market can change. Um, so th that, that's on the, on the administrative side. On the other hand, Right. What you're trying to do constantly is to is to institute a government that will carry out the will of the people. And so the argument is, is that you need also to a more responsive government than limited government. You need, you know, uh, all of these uh, direct democracy initiatives like uh, the referendum, uh, the recall, uh, letting citizens even uh, suggest recommend their own uh, legislation. So the thing is, is that the, the progressives really cannot reconcile these two things. And in some ways, the, the recommendations for things like an expert tariff commission um, or a federal bureau of, of corporations that will distribute uh, fran uh, franchises on, like, uh, on a sort of annual basis, or, uh, licenses for franchises on an annual basis. Um, I, I do wonder to what degree Roosevelt is really serious about that, 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 that is that the way to solve the problem, say, of the tariff, right, this long uh, held problem in American politics, that the way to solve it is through experts. Or his, his argument really that the best way to deal with the tariff is not, don't let Congress deal with it. In fact, he makes a derogatory remark about Congress, you know, whenever Congress tries to fix the tariff, in a general way, it just leads to more special interests and log rolling. So what you need is you need this issue to be taken care of purely by the executive branch and not by uh, and not by Congress. And I, I tend to think that's the drift for Roosevelt behind all these proposals for expertise. What he really means is let the executive set policy in these areas. Not, not Congress, right? Congress is just a collection of special interests. The president, yeah. what, right, can really represent the will of the people. And, and when you use the language of nationalism, in a way, you're already relegating Congress to to, you know, to second class status because, after all, Congress senators Senate represent the states, or senators represent the states. Uh, uh, representatives, rep, you know, are from uh, from districts within the states, so they can certainly be expected to be parochial in their interests and not have the good of the nation at heart. That's very interesting. Yeah, and you, I mean, he's got this line, right, where he says, the new nationalism regards the executive power as the steward of the public welfare. And you, you do wonder kind of how Congress would react to that line. Like, well, what do you think we do, you know? We, <laughs> you know, we're not totally indifferent to the public welfare. And I think in some ways for TR, the more that you could move domestic policy into the executive branch and away from Congress, right, the more that you can actually have uh, policies that can really address the uh, uh, various complex issues of, of a modern commercial economy. Hmm. Jennifer, any more to add on that? Well, I would just say, too, that I think this is another tension within progressivism, which is not just between the executive and the legislature, but between the federal government and the states. And I think that one of the things that when we focus on a speech like this, that we then overlook is a tremendous amount of progressive, uh, uh, what do I say, energy and legislation and change that was occurring on the local level. So, I mean, if you really want to see progressivism in action, I think you're, you see more by looking at city governments and what city governments are doing than necessarily the national government. So the idea that at this moment, 
um, we're already fast forwarding to 2017, 2018 now, and we look to the federal government to, to solve all our problems, I think is, is um, maybe uh, injecting a little too much of, of our present day to the past, that at this moment, the federal government, exactly what its role is and exactly how strong it should be in American society is still very much being contested. And a lot of the reformers in the progressive movement are focusing their energy on state level, local level initiatives and not on federal legislation because they don't trust the federal government and they don't trust the federal government to be free of special interests. So I think the idea that will, that, um, listen, that Roosevelt is now saying to people, trust the federal government to solve these problems is also a message to progressives to say, you know, th that this, this is actually the wave of the future. If you think about the labor movement, for example, you know, the AFL in this moment of history doesn't want the federal government involved at all. Because every time the federal government gets involved in labor disputes, it tends to go on the side of, of capital. So the initial strategy is keep the government out of it. Let us just handle our problems economically. If we can collect a bargain, if we can strike, you know, we can work out a better deal for ourselves than having any government involvement. So I think that even within the progressive ranks, this idea that the federal government should have this kind of power is a case that has to be made. It's not just a case that has to be made against you know, the capitalist forces or, or the reaction forces. Even, even labor has to be convinced that the federal government could act on its behalf. Is that the source of the tension between uh, Theodore Roosevelt on the one hand and, and Robert La Follette? After all, La Follette is a, is a senator Rep uh, senator from Wisconsin. He's very closely associated with the with the Wisconsin idea. What 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 did uh, Roosevelt think about La Follette? Yeah, I think he thought that La Follette. So La Follette and um, kind of other uh, and, and others who were you know uh, much more um, adherents of socialism or communism. I think for. For Roosevelt, he really did regard those uh, uh, those individuals as real threats. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, he's not he's very critical of the stand pattern Republican. On the other hand, Roosevelt went out of his way up until 1912 to stay within the Republican Party and make reform acceptable within the Republican Party not because he thought that was politically expedient or convenient, but because he thought he was, he in some ways is looking for a moderate solution. So the, the, on the other hand, he views, you know, people like La Follette and the socialists and the communists, right, as these are uh, uh, un-American and, and they're, they're real threats. The Wisconsin idea is a, is a great example. Um, the, the argument of the Wisconsin idea is that it's the tariff that's ultimately propping up these uh, monopolies and these trusts. These, these, these trusts would not be able to monopolize the American market if it wasn't for the tariff. So if we could just get rid of the tariff, then we won't have any more monopolies. The, that argument would have destroyed the Republican Party because the Republican Party, the cornerstone of the Republican Party is the tariff. And for Theodore Roosevelt, he views that as a crazy radical idea, the idea that you would just get rid of the tariff. He, his argument is you need some protectionism because he does, you know, partly believe in a, a kind of American first uh, economy. So, and he's also too a, 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 a true, you know, loyal member of the Republican party. On the other hand, he does believe that the tariff needs to be adjusted, um, adjusted in such a way that that it's not that the tariff doesn't serve to artificially support some companies over others um, and doesn't harm our economy. The problem is you don't want to give that issue to to Congress to deal with because they can't understand the complexity, deal with the complexity of the issue, you know, in a, in a body of 535 people. So what you want is some sort of tariff commission that will uh, that can delicately handle this issue and address it in its in its full complexity and then that's the way that you defeat things like the Wisconsin idea but also to uh, socialism uh, socialist movements or communist movements okay. I think uh, I was just gonna say I want to go back to the earlier comment you made John about 
um, why Roosevelt likes the military so much and this idea that he seems to be talking about democracy and power to the people, but then wants these really top-down solutions. You know, I give you an order, take it. You know, I, we have a commission. They're going to tell you what to do. And I think it's also quite interesting in this speech that, again, this kind of emphasis he puts on federal action. And here he'd been a governor of a state. He doesn't say, hey, well, when I was governor, look, I have a model for what worked, or there's no sort of percolating up from the bottom. There's no sort of saying, well, progressives have been doing these different things in different places. This works. You know, I can point to this. Um, and I think this really, he's under acknowledging how much of a debate this is. So if you take two of the big reform movements of the time that end up being successful, the temperance movement and the suffrage movement, Within those movements, there's a lot of debate about strategizing and whether or not this should be going on a you know, locality basis, state by state, county by county, or whether or not you should be pushing for action on the federal government. And even though you end up with two constitutional amendments at the end of the, both of those campaigns, that is not by any means a unified um, strategic approach with inside those movements. And so I think that in some ways, um, you know, this assertion of federal power is even something that has to be convincing within with it among people who are on your side philosophically like they might agree with your prescription of the problem they'll agree that experts need to be involved will they agree therefore that the federal government is the entity that should do this i think if you see a tension between la follette and roosevelt you're going to see the answer is is no and so so even that idea that um progressives that this ultimately must lead to a strengthened federal government executive branch, I think is a mistake we make in looking at how this movement evolves. That this is very much a debate that's that's active and alive. Well, since we're talking about comparisons, why don't we bring in the other great progressive president of the age, Woodrow Wilson. How does his uh, version of progressivism compare? I, I know that the, the, the two men actually loathed one another, um, but, uh, how, how, how similar or far apart were their actual views? That's, uh, I think that uh, in many ways, well, obviously, temperamentally, they're very, very different. And certainly on the issue of the tariff, they're, they're very different. Um, but I think in some ways, the idea of the centralization, the the, you know, the, the idea of increased democracy, the idea of increasing a distribution of wealth, that in some really fundamental ways they're, they're very similar. Um, I think Wilson certainly does not have the same, uh, what do I say, fascination with the military. He doesn't have the same fascination with strenuous life, yet He's as interventionist a president as Roosevelt is. I mean, it's one of the crazy things in American history that I studied the First World War is when people talk about Wilson as sort of a reluctant interventionist. And I mean, that only works when you talk about, when you're looking at Central America, he's all over the place. I mean, he's as willing as anybody to, to intervene in a region that he thinks the United States should rightfully take as its sphere of influence. So in that sense, I think there are perhaps a lot more similarities than sometimes their, their personal antagonisms and the rhetoric might might lead us to believe. Hmm. Yeah, David? I, I, it's, you know, that, that, I have to, you really have to think about that question a lot because it's, it's, a, it's a complex one because, you know, on the one hand, there are kind of two, two Wilsons, and that is there's the Wilson of the 1912 uh, campaign who does take a, a different... Uh, position than um, than Roosevelt on how to deal um, how to deal with uh, these uh, trusts or large or are, are these monopolies large corporations. Uh, their big difference there is um, you know Wilson takes a position. Look, you need you just need to break up these large corporations and try to return back to a state of um, you know moderate competition. Between companies, so you just need to you just need to do some kind of trust busting and break up the large corporations. And in some ways, that's a kind of small government approach uh, for a progressive because what you're saying is, you know, you're not going to have a uh, a lot of active regulation of the economy. You're simply going to have a lot of prosecution. And so the um, so Wilson takes that position. 
That was the position of the Democratic Party for which Wilson was a candidate in 1912. Um, the, it's still the party of states' rights. They don't really like the government solutions. Uh, Roosevelt's position, in, by contrast, in 1912 was, look, it's a waste of time to try to break up these large companies, these large monopolies. Uh, most of them are big monopolies precisely because they're more efficient and more um, effective at, in, in their uh, area of the economy than, than, the, than their competitors. So the better thing to do is not to try to break them up, but rather to accept that most of the nation will be Walmart, Target, something like that. And then what you want to do is regulate them. So let them have the dominant share of the economy, but then um, condition their control of that, uh, of the market, on accepting a large amount of federal uh, regulation. So that's their difference in 1912. However, I mean, if you look at uh, Wilson's um, writings uh, as an academic leading up to 1912, his position is very much on the Theodore Roosevelt side. You need a, 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 a more a robust administration filled with experts who can regulate the economy. Um, he did not see that much benefit in free market competition. And so, I mean, during his academic career, he really, before his political career, he really just sounds more like, more like Roosevelt. They seem to be on the same page. Plus, when he actually does get, when Wilson does get elected president, all of his solutions end up being almost exactly what is proposed by Roosevelt's uh, Progressive Party in 1912. Uh, the introduction, particularly with the introduction of a federal trade commission to deal with the regulation of these large corporations. So I think at the end of the day, the differences between them, as Jennifer said, are just are very minimal. Yeah, and it, you could add into that Federal Reserve System. I mean, he ends up yeah. really, you know, <laughs> involving the federal government even more completely in the right control of the economy. So. Yeah, and an income tax as well. Income tax, right, exactly. Right. And then and then I should uh, add, I'm sorry, because I have to get the First World War into every conversation I have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that when you, you know, Wilson becomes the war president and the way that he centralizes the authority to uh, mobilize the economy and the nation's manpower is, you know, in a certain sense, you know, Roosevelt's dream come true, that the federal government would take this kind of power that it never had during the Civil War. I mean, this is a brand new concept of how to mobilize the nation for war. And, um, and Wilson shows himself very willing to use the full powers at his disposal to, to regulate the country during that conflict. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've heard it said it, it broke Roosevelt's heart that Wilson was the one who got the war. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't, Any that didn't uh, keep, final, that sorry? Didn't him, that didn't keep him from volunteering to take up the, uh, an entire, uh, a, a large uh, command over the, uh, I think over the uh, Eastern Front. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he tried, he tried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any final thoughts? We're almost out of time. Final thoughts on the new nationalism speech. Well, I would just say that um, in rereading the speech, it was just really interesting. I think a lot of these tensions and a lot of these, um, uh, the problems, the solutions uh, resonate so much for today that in some respects, we're having a very similar conversation about um, concentration of wealth, about whether this creates opportunity, whether it restricts opportunity, where should the solution come from, um, that there are some people that are deserving of help, some people that are not. We didn't really get to that part, but I think that that runs through this as well, this idea that you have to be self-reliant and take your opportunity, not just expect something for nothing. And even this valorization of military service as service and this notion that there are some people who are serving the nation more than others and deserve recognition for that. And I think that there's there's a lot in this conversation that, um, as I say, I think kind of echoes some contemporary conversations that we're having today. And it, if you look back at the speech and kind of feel this is a turning point to a certain extent in terms of the direction the country takes, I think it would be interesting to think, are we at a similar turning point? In other words, are we going to answer this conversation somewhat differently this time around? And will we go in a different way or will we, you know, re-embrace this kind of path that Roosevelt and Wilson had laid out for the country at the beginning of the 20th century? 
David. Yeah, I think also too, if, if we, you know, you can take that line that says the new nationalism regards the executive power as the steward of the public welfare. Um, whatever might have been the fate of the Progressive Party, it certainly is our um, sort of bedrock principle of understanding American politics today that the executive is regarded as the steward of the public welfare. Um, if uh, if gasoline costs too much, well, it's the problem. It's the president who did it. Uh, if the economy is tanking, that's the president, right? Everything, right, ultimately falls uh, on on the executive. And even though we have, I think, deep down a sense that somehow that that can't be right as a causal uh, explanation of everything that goes on in the nation. That doesn't change the fact that that is our expectations and that's how we judge uh, our, our our presidents. And in some ways, right, that's kind of led to a, I, I think, an, uh, an, uh, an excessive expectation upon the presidency and also, too, has sort of put Congress in a kind of derision, uh, a derisory st uh, status. It doesn't really it seem to embody the uh, uh, responsibilities and dignity uh, that that, that uh, of that office, and I think that you see that in these cycles of uh, government mm -hmm. shutdowns and things like that. That you know, you just wonder, will, will Congress take its uh, responsibility seriously uh, in, future, uh -huh. in, in future ages? I, I think, in some ways, right, that the uh, in some ways, right, that that has been the primary contribution of progressivism is that emphasis on the executive branch, and it also, too, I think, is in some ways one of our um, major problems in really trying to honestly understand uh, the effectiveness of the, of the federal government today in the, in the life of the nation. All right. Well, I want to thank both of our panelists, uh, David and Jennifer, as, as well as our participants for their questions. Just a reminder about the email you'll be receiving. That will have a link to uh, you click on that and you will receive a uh, certificate of participation. And if you have enjoyed today's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course through the Ashbrook Center. These are offered as part of our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. You can find more information about Ashbrook's online course offerings at teachingamericanhistory.org. And you can help us spread the word about these programs by sharing the archive link, which you'll receive by email next week, sharing that with your colleagues as well as on social media. Our next Documents in Detail webinar will take place Wednesday, February 21st, when our subject will be Franklin D. Roosevelt's Commonwealth Club Address. At that time, I'll be joined by Dr. Lauren Hall of the Rochester Institute of Technology and Dr. Paul Moreno of Hillsdale College. The recommended readings for that webinar have already been posted. We hope to see you back here on February 21st. Have a good evening, everyone.